now now I'm recording all right so um, what can we learn from Hollywood scheme, uh, script writers um, I got inspiration for this talk when I visited the Hollywood studios um, Warner Bros in particular uh, it was a long time ago when I visit and you know that they take you on, on a tram around and they show you different different uh, studios houses and locations and one house in particular uh, i was told that that's where they used to put all of the screen writers back in the golden age so these uh, studios are very old they are more than a hundred years old in that location they change names they change companies but those locations are still very, very old. And when the studios were created uh, during the peak of the industrial area, the beginning of the last century, they followed the organizational model that they knew. How all companies were organized in that era. So following Frederick Taylor's scientific management principles, the head was a decider and all of the rest of the people they were the doers so they see people as clocks in, in, in the machine so the goal was efficiency productivity so they put everyone in a room all of the all the um, script writers and they put them in that particular room because the CEO, or the head of the studio, was next door. So every morning he walked from his car to his office and he stopped by the window of the scriptwriter's room trying to hear for the tackling of the... <coughs> to make sure that the scriptwriter were writing from the typewriters. And occasionally, when he didn't hear any noise or sounds, mm -hmm. he stormed into the room and started screaming, Oh, you're stealing my money. You're taking my money. And that's how they managed the studio in that area. So everybody was an employee on the clock, even the big stars. So at the time, they got to produce 57 movies in one year. So that's more than one movie per month. And they need the scripts <clears throat> because the stars were very expensive. <clears throat> so they were not paid by movie, per movie, <clears throat> like today. They were paid per time. So... <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have eaten popcorn. <clears throat> so they were paid per time. <clears throat> so, and their focus was on productivity, output. <clears throat> so there are different ways to organize work or tasks. <clears throat> so one way I like is what um, here... <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> what we see here, blue work and red work. Uh, but in that area, blue work was what the managers did. Plan, create, focus on outcomes, money. And another type of work is what we call algorithmic work. Any work that can be done following a recipe. Focus on a process, like putting a, a party on the grill and then flipping it after certain minutes, um, typing hello, H E L L O as a process. <coughs> so, but the, the problem that the scriptwriters had was that they were put in a position to be red workers 
and their work involves things that we see on the right. So in those days they have blue workers and red workers. And red workers comply with uh, the decision of their manager. <coughs> Focus was on performance. But we see that, that script writing involves a lot of other things besides typing. So it involves brainstorming ideas for ideas, developing the characters, creating stories, planning the plot, maybe researching historical events. So there's a lot of blue work involved. And research has proven that when Carlos has stick as management tool, is used on cognitive work, well, quality decreases, and cheating doubles. Uh, this is what they did. And yes, they also did some typing. Yeah, you will see a typewriter the, the, over there. So what did this group do to solve the boss problem? Well, of course, cheating. So they pay extra to the administrative assistants and move them next to the window. So they will type all day long, maybe copying the newspaper, making noise. Because the boss was looking for noise. And if your KPI is to hear noise, that's what you're going to find. That's what you're going to get. <coughs> now, today, <coughs> they, they don't need to hide anymore. So Hollywood have evolved a uh, big deal since that era. They work iteratively in iterations. Look, they have storyboards with don't even need Jira for that. And yes, someone you cannot see in that picture, but someone over there is typing. So they're still typing. But movies are like a big monolithic if it movies move, were an application, there will be those monolithic apps that you cannot deliver it iteratively. So on TV, they can do a lot more. So this is an example of a pitch of a TV show that was very famous. That was pitched initially by the two writers to a producer. The producer liked the idea, and, but changed the name of the show to Friends Like Us. And after seven uh, 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 seven page, created a seven-page pitch to, for NBC, and they sold the pilot. And after several script rights, they finally filmed the pilot. That became friends. And that's not it. They keep iterating. So they do table reads with actors, where they have another opportunity to adapt dialogues. And they film in front of a live studio audience. And they don't do that for the laugh. Uh, the laugh. Uh, sound. They do it because if the live studio audience is not laughing, they change. They, they go, the writers get together, and they change a the line and try on a different joke. So they keep iterating. And even after that, they have focus groups. So I always wonder, well, keep writers in Hollywood really change the way of working a lot. What's happened in other industries that we are not changing our way of working that much? Um, yeah, some people may think that the, the union, they have a strong union, but a strong union can negotiate contracts and cannot change how they are being treat, treated by their bosses. So what I really think is that they had all of these learning cycles um, when you produce 57 movies in a year and you have your name attached to a movie, to the product, 
as part of the credits, there are a lot of learning cycles opportunities. So while they were doing some research, I found that they started buying, studio started buying um, scripts from people that were not employees and working on their own time, doing all that research on their own. And those movies became popular. So eventually, they got to, to change from an organization like this, Blue Worker and Red Workers, to something like this, where they are no longer Blue Workers or Red Workers. Um, by the way, this term Blue and Red comes from David Marquette's book, Leadership is Language. And David Marquette predicts that companies doing Red Work will not survive the current area. Uh, um, but this, this transformation is not easy. Teams doing red work sometimes have a tendency to stay in red work. So David Marquette proposes a new playbook for leaders. Um, I'm going to share a link where you can download more information. You don't need to register or provide any, any email. You can download more information about this playbook. And the concept is that what we see in, in the red column no longer works. Does not work with workers doing blue and red. And what works is things that we already know. Control the clock. In Agile, we call them time box. We, we have sprints to control the clock. Collaborate. We commit on goals, road goals, Spring goals, we complete that work, we improve, reflect, and we need to connect all part of the organization. So, <clears throat> but if you really want to see some change happening, we need to find what's our own definition of both success, of his success. What is value for the organization? What is value for the product? We need to create feedback loops, collaborate, and yes, there is some typing. So work is red and blue. And this is the end. I still have one minute for any question. But I'm going to share the link I promised on the chat. And if there are no questions, I can stop sharing. And I can pass the room to Suruchi. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. Mm -hmm. We we'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so let me go on presenter mode. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Sounds good. Thank you. And can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. We can go ahead and get started. Uh, Fernando, please start the timer so that I will not uh, continue talking beyond the time box that we decided. Hello, everyone. My name is Suruchi Patki. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I'm a certified and experienced agile practitioner. Today, we are going to discuss the topic dysfunction mapping, which is nothing but creating hypothesis based plans for change. I'm not the creator for this concept as well as this tool. Uh, this has been created by Michael Lloyd. I have attended the workshop uh, which he uh, conducts pretty periodically. Um, I am a certified dysfunction mapping practitioner um, and I, I was able to apply this process in one of the org organization and I found this process very impactful, effective. That's why I just thought of uh, sharing uh, this topic today 
um, this is a really deep topic. <clears throat> so 10 minutes time box is pretty short. However, I'm going to keep it at high level and pick one example and explain that one example through all the phases of this process. So let's move along. Is this familiar to you? You can see some sad faces, you can see dislikes, you can see some fumes coming, some blasts are happening, someone is typing. So basically, these are issues and issues are everywhere. Challenges are everywhere in all agile teams. No team is exceptional. No team is made up of no challenges. So now, how can we talk about this? These challenges are nothing but the dysfunction. And the goal of this overall dysfunction mapping tool is how can we resolve these issues or challenges in a methodical way? Because the issues are going to come from multiple sides, processes issues, interaction issues. People are overruling uh, the best practices, breaking the rules. They, they are not liking the hierarchy, what, what not. So the challenges are coming from all the sides. This is nothing but the dysfunction, which is not operating as expected in your agile team. And it could be in any forms, complaints, breaking of, breaking of any rules. That is nothing but the dysfunction. And the methodology or <clears throat> the method that will help us in mapping all the steps and resolving the issue is nothing but dysfunction mapping. Dysfunction mapping offers a really good methodical approach to uncover and address organizational challenges, aiding in discovery of significant improvements, crafting actionable strategies and evaluating impactful results. Uh, but I can't say that this is a silver bullet. This, this is a hypothesis-based process. It's, it's all hypothesis. We, we cannot say that this is a silver bullet. It will fit all and it will uh, resolve all the problems at all, specifically when, when we are looking at the organizational level. But it offers a systematic way to solve the problems, define objectives clearly, and demonstrate the value of your efforts. Now let's see how we can dive it into the process step-by-step. Step. Consider one example uh, as a dysfunction and follow the steps. All right, so when we are going to initiate this process in any organization at any level, uh, all we need to do first is actively observe, being an impartial observer. We need to understand before acting or saying anything understanding is very important and having a holistic view of the system is important observation of course active observation is equivalently important along with the active listening here to what people are saying what are they talking nice about what are they complaining about um, interview them ask them question why do you feel like that why do you feel that is wrong why do you feel this is right ask stakeholders and then walk. So observe, listen, and walk are the basic steps you need to follow in this process. So in this observe, listen, and walk process, you will be able to identify definitely a uh, few challenges or issues. I have just crafted, say, around nine issues here. Uh, I know, considering the sensitivity of time, we'll just consider a few. Say, for example, unfinished work every sprint. Sprint goals are not being set up. Product owner doesn't attend planning meeting. These are just examples of few challenges that the teams may be facing. Now, there are going to be some prompts and observations and conversations through which you can identify what's happening. Some of the prompts could, could be, what processes are we ignoring? Are we ignoring to actually create the definition of done? Is the team just delivering whatever they want to deliver at the end, not validating against any quality measures. Observations. Did you observe that the team never looks at the definition of done or the team doesn't set sprint goals? And some conversation, actively listen. We are constantly having to rework these features. These sprint reviews are so boring, that kind of. So basically, Keep an eye open, listen actively, and walk. Those are the first steps you need to do 
eventually you will have a huge funnel of challenges this is just these are just few examples i i don't expect any of you to read through that and that's why it is designed in this way so eventually you will have maybe in two weeks or so you will have 10 to 12 uh, challenges issues gather in the funnel we consider it as a robust funnel now this funnel is full of different types of issues right one issue could be related to in interpersonal issue one issue could be related to not following scrum framework one issue or uh, could be related to maybe not uh, doing unit testing so let's first look at the patterns and try to group them group the symptoms these are going to be symptoms and then identify one issue out of that there could be multiple symptoms that could be tied to dysfunction just giving a layman language example if i have a fever i am coughing that is a symptom but when i am getting diagnosed by flu that's my dysfunction flu is the dysfunction and cough cold is nothing but symptom so let's consider the first thing throughout this uh, 10 minutes or maybe now 8 to 7 minutes and consider how we can proceed further with these steps the more emphasis is on providing or giving time to the next phases we can provide some time for identifying the symptoms but that is endless right so time box how much time you are going to put emphasis on collecting the symptoms and tied to specific dysfunction now this is only hypothesis you can't say that out of these four symptoms you will get only this dysfunction some other team may find different dysfunction in their team through the same symptoms so this is a hypothesis there is no right or wrong on this so this is all hypothesis based moving along when we find any problem and we want it to solve with the team why why team would be ready right to solve then we need to justify the why behind it so we identified the dysfunction product owner doesn't attend sprint planning if you don't justify the why behind it they will say okay let him don't don't show up that's okay cool you always need to have your baseline and background to justify that why because product owner represents a customer and is accountable for maximizing the value of work at the end of each sprint that is where while finding the purpose we are tying the empiricism inspection transparency adaptation to our hypothesis we are going to tie that otherwise anybody can have any kind of pur purpose documented here right so there is a, a really good flavor of empiricism we are going to validate first we are going to inspect what's going on and then transparency is going to be there because we are going to make sure we are going to clarify that in front of everyone that is happening and then adaptation of bringing the product owner in the planning so so far with me we are here till purpose point so we have justified the purpose why we want to resolve this now we got the purpose symptom dysfunction and purpose this purpose this purpose justification will definitely turn the overall scenario from negativity to positivity team was complaining where is bio he is not showing up and now they will think like this wow we need him because we need to maximize the value at the end of each sprint so it turns all the negative mindset into positivity which is really good part of this dysfun dysfunction mapping tool now the time is to create the solution right we have issue solve it we can't just keep it okay we have this issue this issue, this issue. how to solve it so ask the question what can i do to help this purpose to be fulfilled we want the for purpose product owner represents customer and is accountable for the value of work we need to fulfill this purpose what can i do after asking that question you may find different answers again the solution is hypothet hypothesis it's not going to be one solution there might be multiple relevant solutions for example in this case one on one with product owner maybe run scrum training with product owner maybe so these are the solutions once we identify the solution there is a time to measure if we are successful that solution is going to be get applied for few period of time maybe a couple weeks or so and we want to measure if that solution is working or not then finding the tangible measurements such as 
are the number of work items pushed to mid sprint are reducing is the percentage of unfinished work per sprint is reduced all those kind of measures we need to do so basically we are going to observe if the solution is impactful or not consistency so last but not the least this is the dysfunction mapping tool multiple symptoms can be identified multiple symptoms can be tied to one dysfunction purpose is hypothesis it is not something rule however it is tied to empiricism and uh, scrum guidelines solution again it is a hypothesis however that is a tangible solution which we can find as a relevant to be measured and to serve the purpose and of course after certain period of observation we can measure the success this dysfunction mapping tool should be used iteratively and not one done uh, periodically it should be used uh, so that we can continue doing progress um, so that's all i have for you guys today uh, and thank you for allowing me to represent this function mapping tool concept uh, i i'm happy to share uh, the additional links uh, about the creator uh, michael lloyd uh, he has his own organization honest agile um, and he has his template also which can be used to create uh, this kind of template for your teams he actually helps in in going to the organizations and setting setting up this tool so if you need any additional information i can send that as well thank you everyone and i i would like to open up for any questions thank you um i have a question um you know retrospectives right so how would you uh, you know suggest uh, this to be used uh, in conjunction with retrospectives thank you for the question so basically retrospectives are looking back back at the sprint quickly and it is fixed for a definite period many times many times it has a specific focus retrospective items however dysfunction mapping is little bit at higher level it can be at organizational level it can be at any level so from my standpoint this is how i would answer dysfunction mapping tool is widespread and can be applied to multiple teams at a time retrospective is more focused per team and those items will be only brought up during the retro so it has some limitation but uh, dysfunction mapping tool is pretty big broad range uh, which covers multiple multiple stakeholders multiple processes multiple ways uh, so it's a broad that is how i can answer thank you Any other questions? If not, I would like to hand it over to Michael. Thank you, thank you, thanks everybody. Um, I, I want to entertain while I give you some information. So we're going to start with a little dance. All right. So what we're trying to do here is talk about hybrid agility. And before we before we get into it, I'd like us all to get one thing out of our system. <laughs> Repeat after me. It's not agile. Go ahead, say it. It's, it's I, not I, I can see agile. you and I don't not see a lot agile. of lips moving. It's, it's not, not agile. agile. Exactly. Not so agile. when we talk about hybrid, what we're really talking about is the ability. Oh, let's turn off that music. That's kind of nuts. Okay, so when we talk about hybrid agility, what we're really talking about is, can you all see my screen? Okay, what? No, you can't? Okay, hold no. on. No, we can't see your screen. We there see we you. There we go. So when we talk about hybrid agility, what we're talking about is the use of a mixture of agile and planned processes like project management to meet an organization's goal. And to, I'm going to share with you a case study. So I, I'm not really big into rhetoric. I'm really big into showing you how it works, because if I can show you how it works, you'll open your mind, right? So we're going to talk about how we were able to improve inside sales of a cloud platform with project by using project managers. So a couple of terms inside sales. When you're in a large organization, especially IT, and you've got a product that you want to sell folks uh, or that you want folks inside your company to use, what you're going to do is have a, an organization that will go out and contact business units that may want to use your service. Now, in a, pla a platform as a service, 
is something like a server and an operating system or other application that's minimally installed so that other people can go in and work inside of your platform. Now, over my career, I've developed three of these. Uh, one was uh, an EBS platform. Uh, the second one was something called Carafe, which is an OSGI or Java platform. And the second one was a cloud platform. So specifically what we're going to talk about today is how we were able to improve our cloud platform's ability to perform inside sales by leveraging our project managers. So to start, uh, it started with one scrum team. They were focused on the cloud. I can't remember exactly which cloud it was, but it was only one cloud provider. And what they did was they looked for people that had skills or that had a need and desire to use that specific cloud. And inside of the scrum team here, you can see that we had a scrum master, a product owner, and all these devs, they were at an architect level. So we really overloaded the team with people that were the experts. And as a result, they were wildly successful. And as a result, two years later, the organization grew from 10 people to 200. And we formed it under what's called an, an agile release stream. But before we continue with that, I want to caveat this by saying, um, in every single iteration of a platform as a service I've helped develop, we always had some sort of a high level organization that was similar to a release train uh, organization that was solely there to coordinate the activities of all these teams. So as you can see with 200 people, uh, we had about 20 different teams. And also you'll note that 200 people in one organization is a lot. And one of the reasons that it happens that way is that, or one of the reasons it's, it's a lot of work is because the groups will eventually form inside of that, that organization. So they'll granularly separate. And that's what happened here. So in, from two years to three years, we grew to 300 people, which was way too much for any sort of one organization to manage. And because the groups had been working together and they put a lot of thought into it, they decided that they were going to break out into two organizations, one for inside sales and one for focusing on improving the platform as a service. So. One of the goals that you want to do creating a platform is you want to take all the governance and security activities and bake it in at a deep level inside of your platform. Then you're going to want to create design patterns or blueprints, some sort of an architectural artifact that will show people that want to use your system how they can leverage all those things that you've baked in. And the, 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 prop, the value proposition for the implementers is instead of having to take five or six months to find out what's not security, uh, what doesn't pass security or governance, and then re, uh, rewrite some of your product to, to use that, they can turn that months long process into a week long, as long as they follow the rules. Um, so that's what the platform as a service focus release train is going to do. The next one is the inside sales organization and their job, what they're going to do is they're going to go um, from this, we're going to call it the cloud services group. They're going to go out into different business units and they're going to try to go and get people or organizations to want to use their platform. But the problem is we were three years into this. And most of the organizations, most of our teams were scrum teams. I think we had a Kanban team that was thrown in there for engineering, but these were all scrum teams. And anybody that's worked with agility long enough knows that if you start as a scrum team, they're going to want to work with other agile teams, preferably scrum, but at best agile. And they're going to shy away from planned organizations or traditional projects. Right. And as a result, 30 only 30% of our potential client base was these were these agile teams, but 70% were traditional projects. This was a large company. It had been in shit around for over 100 years, and they still had a lot of older artifacts. And frankly, for some of the teams, projects just fit better inside their culture and, and agile didn't. And so some of the feedback that we got from our leaders, one person said, if the biggest weakness of your platform is that it can only be used by teams that use agile process, 
what does it say about the utility of the underlying technology? And this was from one of the business leaders that was actually funding the organization that was becoming very um, frustrated with the fact that we were really focusing only on agile teams. He wanted us to expand it beyond that. And then we had a business owner, sort of like the, think of them as the highest level product manager of the entire group that said, we're not here to sell agility. We're here to expand the use of our cloud projects. And this was a, a big theme. And so we had a real big problem that we needed to fix. So here's how we did it. We changed our engagement model to work with teams using any internal processes. And the way that we did that was first, we created a, we had a high level business owner. So inside this organization, they had ranks. We found somebody at a high level rank that was very close with a specific business unit. And their job was to initiate the contact, initiate the sale of our cloud services to them. And once they had, because they already had that level of gravitas with the business unit, they were able to start identifying organizations that would want to work with us. But again, we didn't want to just cater to agile organizations. We wanted to open ourselves up to projects. And this is where the real hybrid innovation came in. We created a product ownership team that consisted of BAs, but also had a project manager. And you'll see here on my slide, I call it a PMP. Um, and the reason for that is, a lot of organizations will have homegrown project managers who are really just really focused on idle processes and making sure that they can deploy something regardless of the framework. But here, out of respect for the PMBOK version 7, which requires mastery of agile project management in addition to uh, regular project management, in fact, their test certifies both of those areas, we needed to make sure that we had a PMP certified project manager helping us. Therefore, they wouldn't only be useful when it came to uh, plan projects, but also when it came to translating and working with the team for the, the other more agile projects. In addition to that, we added two architects who were there to make sure that whatever work, whatever teams we were working with from the business unit, they uh, played by the rules. And we did that at an architectural standpoint. So in their planning process, we immediately started blacking it, uh, back, uh, baking in the, the, uh, the low level platform stuff. The, the PMP translation error um, more than doubled our potential internal clients. So our agile projects were 30% of our potential client base, 40% of our internal uh, project base was were, were planned projects. The other 30%, they were operations and maintenance teams. They were really more suited to Kanban and they weren't really uh, candidates for the cloud. So simply by adding that PMP translation error, um, we were able to massively expand the number of teams that we could work with. So this was a massive innovation that helped us out a lot. And so the takeaways is, first of all, it's not agile. It wasn't intended to be agile. It's a hybrid implementation. And now that we've gotten that out of our system, when we enter Q&A, we don't have to beat it up because it isn't agile. The second thing is the smart use of credentialed project managers in our inside sales teams increased our potential clients. So this was an agile project management and agile um, setup that actually benefited the organization instead of just checking boxes. And with that in mind, I'm going to open it up to our Q&A and that's it. So what are your questions? Uh, go ahead and raise your hands and I'll call at you one at a time. Call on you. Nobody. Okay. So go ahead, Arson. Yeah, I got a question about uh, what uh, the the biggest challenge you faced during this transformation. Uh, we initially brought in uh, tribal project managers that didn't understand how projects really ran, and that was the reason that we started only using certified project managers in these cases. Uh, once that was done. Um, the team had already gotten beaten up because they were only focusing on agile organizations or agile teams. And so they were over that hump. But if I were to deploy this from the get go without it, I think the, the biggest issue would be the term, it's not agile being fought against the scrum master saying we can't work with that. And there are ways to overcome that. Again, um, 
experiencing failure and then having a solution is one of the best ways to do that. Is that answer your question, Arsene? Yeah. Is it what is any resistance uh, in, in, in a team when you transform to us? I'm sorry, what was the question? What, what was the resistance of the team? Um, the, the client was very, very tight knit and they were more invested in success than they were in agility or in project management. So the introduction of the program of, of the project of the PMP, there wasn't a lot of resistance on the teams to that. They'd been doing it for a long time. They realized that not being able to interact with 70% of the potential clients was a problem. And so they, they came around to it. Thank you. Who's next? Go ahead, parents. Is it Peretz? Well, I had to find the unmute key. Um, Brett, so is, Brett is next one? Or? Was, was I next question? Yeah, you were next and then Martina. Okay, so um, just real quick. Th these were all existing systems that were already uh, it, um, sort of hosted someplace and pushed into the cloud? Yeah, so this was a... They wanted it to be a lift and shift from on-prem to cloud, but what we found out was architecturally that wouldn't work because of the hooks that we had in. So the value proposition that we offered, which was that they could get fast security compliant approval, fast governance approvals, was overridden by lift and shift. So we had to make sure that we architecturally train them on the use of what are called blueprints and design patterns to make sure that they play, 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 played by the rules. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. I'm, I was reaching for the idea of the source of requirements. It sounded as if you pushed a lot of the administrative sort of requirements into that um, cloud thing. <laughs> right. So when you separate it up, so that would have made life easier for the PMP types because they're always looking for defined requirements and scheduling and budget and stuff. Whereas Agile, the, some of that stuff is not known up front. So the actual translation that was done by the PMPs was mm -hmm. um, when they were working with a project oriented group, we would identify a market date, we would identify all the steps that needed to be done by that market date, and a work breakdown structure and integrated master schedule was created by the PMP, and they used that to communicate with the team with with our clients internally those epics and features mapped into jira epics and features and we were much more fluid with our desire to meet dates um, with there than we were with the project manager and of course when you've got a pmp they usually have enough seasoning to be able to give bad news to somebody like not being able to meet a specific date on a wv or an ims all right martina So I had two questions and you already answered the first, uh, the benefits, uh, you know, it's provided. And can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you already answered that question. But the second question, typically, you know, and you mentioned the seventh PIM book, uh, you know, that it's already introducing, you know, kind of dual approach, your project management and also potential kind of agile iteration, you know, uh, iterative approach. So uh, was the expectation that the project managers uh, will learn from this experience and eventually transition to more type of agile approach in the future or will kind of uh, leverage this as a learning experience to mature more in this, in this space and eventually transition to more agile organization? Or was it like, okay, that's it, you end up with hybrid and this is your end state? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, for we they had to be current PMPs, which means that they understand understood agile project management. And ah, the second thing is we wanted to make sure that they had epic owner training, specifically on how to uh, how to run an epic and how to manage the the user stories and features within one. The combination of those two factors made sure that they were more open uh, and understanding to how the organization ran because our clients did not want to move to project to agile if they were projects we found that this was a continue this this would be a long-term uh, sort of assignment for the project managers does that answer your question awesome how am i doing on time right on time <laughs>
<laughs> he was peeping. Awesome. So who's next? So Greg. Greg Master. Yeah, I'm here. Let's try. Sure. Right, 5 a.m. Watch your videos on LinkedIn. They're great. Oh, do you? All right. Thanks. Appreciate that. Hmm. Let's see how the sharing goes here. Okay. So, that said. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. So here I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. Um, you know, using OKRs as part of a coaching session as an alternative. If you've ever done agile coaching or scrum master, you're coaching your teams and everything like that, um, or individuals one-on-one, you know, and an alternative to asking a classic. So what problem can we work on today? Right. And that, that one gets stale really fast. I mean, it's okay to start with maybe very open-ended um and, and and it can and you can go into that stale mode where let's see if this page in advance things work okay good so are your agile coaching sessions losing value i mean are your coaching sessions feeling like they are um your coaches are canceling sessions because they're just not feeling the value from it you know are the classic questions just not having the same effect as they had before and one of the things i changed and in, in, in things is you know what is it in for me as a coachy right um one of the things i've seen is symptoms not having goals in these coaching sessions like doing circles doing the same thing over and over again and not feeling like you're really getting somewhere even the scrum guide now stresses goals versus just solving problems, right? Now the big thing is gold. What are your goals versus just each individual story as much? Um, why don't we do the same for our coaches, right? Why don't we same that same, apply that same goal mentality for the coaches or we'll coach them and be partners along their goal journey? Part of the, you know, if you look at some of the different coaching, agile coaching guides and things, we're supposed to be mentors as well as coaches and and teachers and different activities. So this gets into that whole mentor coaching career development phase of um, people we coach. So what are objectives and key results? Uh, just looking at just a brief look at what they are and what they're not. You know, um, OKRs fill the gap between a bold vision and what the heck do I do today, right? Um, the, the bold vision makes people feel, makes them energized. Having that bold goal where they want to do versus, hey, I just had a bad day today with my team. How do I fix it? Or, or something like that. Um, use for radical change. Move the needle. So if people are just getting into this cycle and they're getting bored and, you know, they get uh, stir crazy and want to move on, these OKRs can help them give them a goal and energy level to move the needle in their career. A little OKR history, just so people know. Yeah, haven't done it. Most big companies are doing OKRs now. Um, up, managed by, by Objective was in 1954 with Peter Drucker. We had Smart Objectives, 1981 by George Dorn. Um, Balance Scorecard back in 92. And Google really made OKRs popular back in 1999, which is now, what, 24 years ago, 25 years ago? So it's been around for a while, and it's amazing how many companies are just getting into it. Um, OKR should be, when we look at ob objectives, the answer, where do I need to go? So in your, you're going to help craft this as a coach with your people you're coaching, um, your coachees, you know, an aspire direction, you know, they shouldn't be measured at points. Like I want to achieve this. What are the key results? How do I know when I, that I'm getting there, right? Those are the kind of things that you would help them craft and initiatives. You know, what will I do to get there? What is act activities? One of the benefit of doing this as well, and whether you're doing individual coaching on your own company, like I do that too. I have a little mastermind group where we, we actually build up OKRs as part of the mastermind. You can also do it inside the corporate because now people are getting used to what an OKR is. How does it really work? How, what works? What doesn't work for me? And they're learning. So the OKR cadence, the way I 
training OKRs is you have go by quarters. Most corporates have a quarterly OKR and a yearly OKR or whatever. And then every quarter they come up with some new OKRs and you apply the same thing from a personal perspective. They may, and I'm going to go through how that process works. So every, every quarter you go through your list of things they want to do. What are their goals? Where do they want to go? Right. Quarter one, I, I do a brainstorming of ideas. Session one with my coachees. You know, here's an example list that came out of one um, coach I was working with. You know, they wanted to get a new job. They wanted to take a couple safe trainings. They wanted to do leading safe. They wanted to read a digital book, uh, the book, the uh, digital trailblazer, a uh, couple of LinkedIn courses. I mean, there's a whole list. And one of my jobs as a, as a, as a coach is like, okay, you can get all that done in a quarter. Well, no. Okay. Let's pick one or two. What do you want to do? And the same principle as you're walking them through this process as an agile coach, they're learning how they would actually translate that to their own teams in their own organization. So they're learning by getting their goals and at the same time getting experience that they can put on their resume, by the way, for working with OKRs, even if the company doesn't do OKRs, but at least they'll give, give them an idea. Here's an example of a personal OKR map that we did for someone wanted to get a new certification. So the objective in this case for this person, I did this on Miro. I have a whole Miro board that I have different people. Everyone I in the mastermind put their ideas on. The whole mastermind works together once. But if you do one-on-one, it's the same principle. And for yourself, you have your objective. My objective is to take the safe exam, right? Uh, key results um, as a measure, getting high, getting high scores on the practice test, you know, read safe handbook at least three times, go through the, this, the safe handbook a couple times. And then some of the initiatives was to take the practice exam, um, practice uh, the network, you know, have a practice network, um, take the safe um, scrum exam. So that was one of the things that they came up with were their initiatives. So you break that all down on your first or second session. This is like session number two. So the first session, do brainstorm. They go away and say, pick what you want, come back. Next time you have a conversation, you get into where they want to go with this, what what one they pick, and then you help them break down on what might be a good OKR. And then here's someone here had a uh, career path. And actually, I did a whole meetup session on this, and it's on YouTube. So if you type in OKR 5 a.m. Master Scrum, you actually see the group of people going through all their their choices and what we how we walked it through as part of our um, little meetup gathering we did. In this case, someone wanted to become a direct, go from director to CPO, uh, chief person personnel officer, or people chief people officer. I guess this really word. They wanted a new job, and we kind of broke down what does that new job look like. What is the new job? So you do these conversations, ask these questions, so they can steer themselves into what they really want. And then one hundred and one was one of the key results was review one hundred CPO positions in LinkedIn. What do they have? What are their career things? You know, some of their initiatives, work on the resume, find a CPO mentor. So find a mentor that can help them and, and review the CPO. So look at all those resumes for all those CPOs and, and review them and, and see what they have. Um, so that was something we just came up with. And, and this can apply to anybody you're coaching, right? What are their goals? What do they want to do? And you, and you get them thinking just like you do the quarterly breakdown. You have an initiative, you have an epic, you have some stories. They're going to work so many stories per sprint and you have to figure out what your sprint cadence is. For myself, when I coach my mastermind, we do we do quarters because we want to get in that quarter amount of time and we do like three week sprints per se. Um, just we find out personal work is kind of harder than um, getting done in two weeks. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer because you're doing it on the side or it's an extra thing you're doing or maybe just one little thing you're doing during the um the work day so it's not a full-time thing like um, developers and teams work on in this case in my mastermind group we actually did it in jira so we actually created i created for them a way to look at epics and the stories they want to work in each sprint and how it progresses through or the subtasks these i think these were stories in the subtask per um how they're going through the sprint and, and break it down. So we kind of did that to get some practice when I was 
training them to said, well, you get practice on Jira as well as learning the OKRs and how to write a story and what works, though it doesn't work. So that when you coach as a scrum master or work with your teams, you know how hard it is. That's right. I'm not just telling somebody what to do. I do it on my own. So it's a good point of reference to build that credibility, that trust that we need with the teams that we, we coach and um, scrum master. Um, we come up with sprint events, like with the coachy. We do a sprint planning. We plan out the initiative, like I was talking about. Um, we create the stories. Well, the coachy creates the stories, just like in a team. And then we kind of review them together. Does it make sense? And when we do the mastermind, actually get a couple other people to review them as well. Just like a real team. Um, and then we do a check-in once a week. We don't need daily check-ins for this. Just to see how we're progressing on our way through the sprint. Or our time box was three weeks. And then at the end of the sprint, we do a actual review. Uh, we have the coaches share um, what they actually created or did or what they accomplished. And we look at the body of work that was done during that sprint. So this way, now they're they're accountable. And one of the keys of this coaching is the accountability. It looks like we're almost done. Um, the new idea is to bring energy back in the sessions. You have five more minutes. Oh, okay. Getting people excited gives them credibility with their team and organizations, like I talked about. Gives them experience that on what works and what does not work because they're actually doing it themselves. So now they can bring that. And there's no more excuses for reasons not to meet. I don't have any problems today. Okay, well, let's talk about your career goals. What did you come, what do we come up with? And have that interaction and see, are they progressing? I see so many people I coach and people I talk to, they don't work on their own health and well-being while they're there. They're so concerned about everyone else. Like, what about you? What do we want to do for you? Right. Here's a couple list of videos for anybody who wants that are on here. And I'll share this slide deck that, that are on YouTube that you can watch for OKRs. If you don't know much about OKRs, here's a couple book recommendations. And it's more corporate level. But my thing is you apply it to when you're coaching to give you something more than just how are you doing today? How do you feel today? What's your problem? I don't have any problems. Everything's peachy keen. Okay. Let's work on your, how are you doing your goals? So that's something I wanted to sh uh, share with you all. Um, I want to wish, I want to say thank you. Happy scrumming. I do have a book out there. Anybody on this session, if you send me a note, I can send you a PDF of the book. I am one of the chapters out of 20 about change and stuff like that. I'm more than happy to get that to you. But I just want to share that as a change, a different way of thinking about when you do the one on one coaching with your team or your coachee. So that's what I have, unless you have any questions. I can share my experiences or, or anything you might have with that. Is this sounds like something you might try? Thank you. We have uh, up to three minutes for questions. I guess I explained it good enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. Try it. Try it with your teams. Oh, we got a great question. Hey, Greg, um, hey. can you share any experience where you got a coachee and um, at the initial stage, the coachee's expectations were different. And then as you started working with that coachee, then mm -hmm. the expectations ex expanded. Do you have any kind of experience like that? And how did you tackle that? Like, for example, if that coachee is with you just to get a guidance on two topics and he he wanted to get some specific outcome out of those two topics but then in the, afterwards oh it enhanced how did you tackle that yeah so one thing is the teaching on topics right on um, scrum topics that's a normal thing how do you do this what's this i want to do this and i would change in the questions here's what you know what are you thinking what were your plans okay what are the good you know and we'll do some coaching questions um powerful questions on what they want to do so they can develop it but when the reason for this thing is that sooner or later, you can't coach somebody how to do a sprint planning anymore. You can't coach them on a daily sprint. You run out of things that you're teaching. You're no longer teaching. Now you're coaching and mentoring, right? And the whole idea behind this is you're coaching them along so that they get energized with what's in it for them, right? And, 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 that, and that's the idea on that one. Um, but yeah, they get bored. I, that's why I went to coaching. 
um, after a certain while, a scrum master, I'm like, what do I do? They all know scrum. They don't want me to tell them about a 15 minute time box anymore. You know, they don't want to hear that anymore. So I had to come up with ways to, you know, help them grow. Right. So, and, and find out because as they grew as grew as individuals, then everything else went well. I have a visitor here that's wanting my attention. <laughs> Oh, if you haven't seen on my show, there's bubbles. So, any other questions? Okay. Then I will stop All sharing. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. Awesome. And we can pass the mic, the virtual mic to John. Good evening. I guess Thanks. I'm in the way of the rest of your evening at this point right so uh let me let me share my screen i'm john margettis uh i'm actually based in northern virginia but thank you for having me this evening uh, i'll talk to you about uh, bottom line agility and uh that's a lot of this material is actually from one of the courses that i have one of the agilomics courses but um, it's really an art of preventing low value investment before money is spent. Um, and what does it have to do with Agile? Well, we're going to take a look here in, in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to paste some of this information as well in the chat. But um, let me go to the next slide. So it's when we look about, if we look at Agile via an economic lens, we uncover this path to value side thinking. And, and I, I like to coin that term value side thinking because we have a lot of cost side behavior that we see. Uh, we see it, these, you know, every time there's a downturn in the economy, everyone focuses on cost, 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 but they don't think of value, value, value. And um, a lot of times, and, and that's problematic, you know, and we can optimize the delivery organization all we want. That's great. But uh, if we don't make sure that the organization's efforts are spent on on this on only high value and not low value initiatives. That's even better, and that's what a lot of this is about. Uh, bottom line agility. How do we know that? And preventing the expend the expense before it even we even spend it. So we got to go back to some basics, basic uh, microeconomics. Uh, we're reminded that to maximize profits, we can do that when the gap between uh, total revenue minus cost is maximized. Um, and this came from, you know, a source you can look it up, but that, what does that really mean? Um, you know, ultimately, you know, Agile, as a general rule of thumb, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's good to focus on cost reduction, but, and those are cost side decisions, but as long as what, as long as this decision does not negatively impact the overall profit margin or value. We see value destruction all the time. And and that's that's a problem based on decisions. And, and this is preventable. It's, uh, it's something we can train executives in. And there's a big gap in the industry. Agile has its roots in lean thinking. We know that. It is an economic mindset by definition. Uh, elimination of waste, continuous improvement, or efficiency, if you want to call it, uh, drives down cost of operations and cost of production. Great, fantastic, right? And it's supposed to also accelerate delivery of profit or value. That's the theory. Now, a lot of the big agile methodologies out there on their websites have advertised things like, and I'll quote it, uh, but it's out there on the internet, 50% improvements in time to market. Uh, and these are typical results in their implementation case study library. That's great. But this accelerated delivery should normally increase profits for any company. Isn't that true? That's what we would expect. That means we should see a correlated increase in aggregate annual value or profits between pre and post agile adoption over the course of time. But is, you know, where is the evidence of that at this point? 
so let's let's take a look at a couple of things. Do we have evidence? So let me repeat. Here's the industry challenge to solve, right? If the cost of development is going down, faster release cycles, in theory, we should see a corresponding increase in uh, company profit, increased earning per share. So let's look at the last two decades of Agile. And I know this, this chart ended around 2015, but it, it, you get the point in a second here. Um, this is Agile adoption across you know 475 you know large companies uh and and you see what we'd already know the history as you got deeper into the 2010s close to 2020 there's kind of a hockey stick effect most people are getting into the ad onto the agile train we knew that that's history great but what what does that mean that means we should see the benefits now economically let's look at the s p 500 earnings per share chart in the last, you know, in, in, in that 20 year period. Um, so that's what it is, but let's look at the correlation. Is there a correlation side by side? I don't see it. So what does that mean? We've invested billions of dollars in Agile. We would expect to see that the reduction in cycle times, the accelerated value delivery and all that kind of uh, you know, jargon that we hear day to day would in fact correlate in on the company's bottom line. And this mismatch and correlation, I, I feel is one of the uh, sources of, of misunderstanding and, and why we hear a lot of uh, grumblings from time to time when people start saying, oh, I didn't see the value out of Agile, I didn't see this. So we have a mismatch in expectations. Or is it a mismatch in expectations? Or is there a problem somewhere else? But I, uh, but this, this is an interesting moment. And this is what has fueled my interest in, in this uh, area of, of our industry. Why aren't we seeing more of these news articles? This um, was a case study, a real one, where in a finance organization, uh, agile, uh, agileomics approach was uh, applied, and it reduced the daily average of past due invoice amounts by fifteen to twenty percent. Uh, well, you you think that that's something, but that that was millions and millions of dollars that the company did not have to borrow. <clears throat> And because the company did not have to borrow, the next quarter, Wall Street noticed because that money went where? Back to earnings per share. And this spike, of course, afterwards COVID hit, that was a different story, but a portion of this spike where it's been uh, circled with this oval is attributed directly to this uh, approach. So now we see the correlation in earnings per share. And the Motley Fool um, reported, this is the actual report. I've, uh, we, we've redacted the name of the company because we, they don't want to be advertised too much. But this was good news. <clears throat> and this last sentence, in addition to a vote of confidence from Wall Street, the company's success in improving its financial health and and announcement of a multifaceted effort to reward shareholders. Again, yeah, if you have extra money, you're going to increase earnings per share, right? That's what this is about. Why did we not see that correlation in a wider sense? Here's a correlation right here. We can circle it. Why didn't we see it in a wider sense? So that's the problem to solve, I believe, in the next uh, few years. And yeah, I, I could pause there for a second if, if we want to do some um, some Q and A for a second. We can do it right now if you want. Because I, I I have two more slides, but uh, we can we can pause on that question right there. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so the question I've got is about, um, I work with a lot of 
publicly traded companies. And yep. it, it's been my experience that the CFO who usually has 30 or 40 years of accounting experience is probably a CPA, may even have a doctorate in accounting. It's very difficult for somebody without an accounting background to convince them to change their billing cycle, especially when they'd have to justify it to stakeholders and get the SEC involved. So how do you overcome those obstacles? Well, this didn't change the billing cycle. This reduced the amount of past due invoices just by doing changing things in their in their operating space, making them more agile. And by by reducing the um, past due amounts in millions and millions that were there, because it was a very short building cycle actually. So every day was was significant. If someone didn't press one button, they ended up being past due. It was that kind of thing. So we, we targeted that, the, the low hanging fruit, and, and it had an immediate impact, of course, but um, it, it involved doing um, uh, interesting cross-functional teams, uh, but with, within finance, not within software engineering. So it, that was, that's a whole other you know, topic that we can talk about one day. But, but it, it wasn't that we changed the billing cycle, no. It, it was, we did some things that impacted their uh, cash, uh, order to cash, uh, and, and shortened it. Yeah, so I'll just go you through. You have five, five more minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Gary, you got a question on this? Yeah, well, yeah, as sort of or observation, I mean, <clears throat> so number one, I mean, your point about Agile's general impact, I mean, is, is well taken, although I think that really represents the fact that, um, you know, Agile has been focused solely or mostly on the delivery side and not not the wider wider system. Um, and and so, you know, definitely, I think that's the future of Agile is to apply it more more system wide. But um, but I did have like it just seems like you're pointing to the correlation there. This is one example, right? Is a small sample size. I mean, I agree, like what you did was you applied a tool in a very appropriate way, right, to to get to get a result. I just, you know, like it's it's kind of hard to compare that one specific thing to the general application of agile across all, you know, all companies, you know, over a period of, of time. But but I I support your point and I mm. I, I get it. Yeah. Well, it's it's a general question. Like if if billions and billions and billions have been spent. What's the ROI on that, and and where is it? Like that. That's what I was getting at. That yeah, at some no, point, I, yeah, someone's got to show it, and yeah. and it, we're having a hard time as an industry doing exactly what we're doing here in this in, instance, saying, "Oh, here it is, right here." You know, for example, this thing is part of this spike was done because of this, and by the way, it was reported uh, in the news, so. We need more of this. That, that's my point. Like, where is it? Like, we, we got to get to that level. Go ahead, Greg. I don't know if all the big companies in S&P 500 were doing Agile in 2015, to be honest with you. I don't think they got there yet. I don't know. The one, I coached so many Fortune 5s that weren't Agile when I started with them in the yeah, it's I, around I that think, start point. So I think this I think this hockey stick went up even further to the 2020. And and the S P here goes to 2019. So my my point is that this hockey we know agile kept going up and up. Okay. But this we don't see that kind of correlation. Yeah. But that, that's what I was pointing out. Like, but here I know that. Part of this spike was because of some, and I have another couple examples with publicly traded companies that I did not include here. Uh, I, I've been pretty obsessed with like making sure that, you know, if there's something newsworthy that I can trace back to work that was done in Agile, I, I save those. Uh, I have articles from 12, 2012, from 2013 in places I work, uh, and, and I have that, all, all that archive, that portfolio saved. And uh, I have I have others that I can't. They they don't want me, you know, publishing. But um, yeah, I just want to 
one second, I'll, I'll show the last two slides before I run out of time. But the solution to this is we got to do some value side mindset training from top to bottom. We got to train people on preventing unnecessary unnecessary cost and costly learning curves using these real case studies. We have to train on how to quantify business cases from a value side perspective at the highest levels. A lot of people, you know, just stick their hand in the wind and wherever it goes, right? Um, and they really don't know how to uh, formulate business cases that are measurable. Continuously adopt value side analytics and methods in your organization. And you want to disrupt waste, not whip, not work in progress. That's one thing. And uh, the areas that I focus on in particular are, you know, reducing whip by prevent preventing low value projects. I, I you know, I'm involved with HR finance and, and other items beyond IT. Uh, I'm, I have a lot, I did a lot of work on J curve cost of disruption analysis. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of work in uh, preserving and preventing, you know, a lot of things through third-party agile contracts ahead of time, catching things in the contract, and identification, quantification, prevention of waste early on. So uh, I'll pause there, and we can uh, have more questions if we have time. I see a hand. Who is that? Or is that yours still, Greg? Okay. Yep. And any other questions? I just think it's a it's a space that hasn't been explored or pushed much by the major methodologies. It's been largely, you know, it's a big opportunity, but I, I just don't know how we can expand on it. Uh, wasn't WIP one of the waste types? Work in progress. Um, we have to make sure that we're working on never let low value projects get into whip. That's the point. So how much of your whip today, if you're drowning in whip has low value things that you shouldn't have been involved in to begin with. And you find out after the fact, after all the money has been spent, that maybe you shouldn't have done it. And, but you've wasted, you know, people's time and effort. That, that was the point there. Maybe it didn't come out too clearly. Ken, you have a question? Yeah, I'm kind of curious, like you're using EPS for this yeah. to do the um, kind of cost benefits challenge or, or justification, I guess, of it. Um, have you looked at using any other metrics rather than EPS? Because I mean, a lot of things could be, could impact EPS, right? I, I kept it, um, I just wanted something simple. And the reason I chose EPS is if we're talking about profit, at the end of the day, yes. Um, a company can do retained earnings and choose not to issue earnings per share. We, we know that, but typically when someone is surprised and the reason I, I, I started with EPS, the first correlation that got into the news at, at a place that I worked at in 2011 and 2012, we, we repeatedly after two or three quarters in a row, we kept surprising uh, wall street and and the news was, oh, there's an extra 25 cents EPS that, that we weren't expecting because they, they were giving the earnings. So typically when there's a lot of extra like surprise profit um, that the analyst did not expect, and you can correlate that back to something that you did or not you, but like the, the program did based on, you know, agile uh, whatever it was, transformation, whatever whatever you want to call it, um, efforts, that usually makes the news. And I, I do believe at the macro level, when you look at the S&P 500 uh, and you consider the macro picture of who, which companies started adopting Agile to Greg's earlier point, maybe by 2015, not all of them, but by 2020, certainly most of them had something. Um, and you don't see that, you know, hockey stick, let's say, uh, then then you want to start questioning what's going on. Uh, there is an answer. I know we don't have time to go into that here. Um, I, I do go into it in my courses. I, I know, I believe I know what the answer is, but that opens just another large question 
uh, about how do we train the executives who uh, make the decisions to make these investments to not make them uh, by calculating early on what what might not be valuable and and figuring that and identifying that early before the money's spent and that's what bottom line agility is is trying to train and focus on uh, a lot of case studies a lot of trying you know learn from uh, you know, other people's uh, situations and you don't need to go through the same experience yourself if you can educate yourself about what happened here there elsewhere and and that way you can prevent uh, repeating um, the same mistakes or reinventing the wheel training 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 right so we have the experience we, we need to be able to break into that circle i'll pause there for now that i've taken a lot more than five minutes and people are getting tired so yeah, all right we are right on time where it's eight in the east coast yep. i want to thank all of the speakers very interesting you were able to keep the audience until the end. So uh, in the chat, I just posted the link to our YouTube channel where you're going to be able to rewatch some of this talk or if you miss any part. Uh, also, we have great talks coming in April and May. Um, we will probably have a new uh, Lightning Talks or Link Coffee after that in June and July. So if anyone wants to volunteer, wants to speak, or if anyone also wants to help with the coordination, that's, uh, we have the doors open for anyone. Please join, contact any of us, Ken, myself. And again, we thank you and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Nice to meet you all too. It was my first time here. So yeah. thank you everyone. Come back. Thank Thanks for coordinating for Fernando and